a whole theory of how to utilize atomic weaponry. You have to realize that the atomic weapon, the first A-bomb is dropped in Nagasaki in 1945, but nobody really knew what to do with it. I mean, when they dropped the first bomb in New Mexico, in Alamogordo, nobody really knew what was going to happen with that bomb. Some scientists took bets as to whether the whole world would go up in flames. They didn't know what was going to happen, whether a chain reaction would begin and the whole earth would be destroyed. Obviously, it wasn't. But once that weapon was developed, then they had to come up with a way of using that weapon. Because after all, its power was immense. They used, we used it twice in Japan, but would we use it again? And if we used it again, what would happen? RAND, because it was basically the only think tank that was in charge of thinking about those things, came up with the whole theory of how to use these weapons. Basically, then, it came up with the whole theory of second strike capability, which is that it really doesn't matter what the other side does to you, what matters is how bad can you injure them after you have been attacked yourself. In other words, if you're able to survive the attack by your enemy and you're able to counterattack, that's what really counts. And thus, a whole new nuclear strategy came about, and that's, you know, because of Iran. Iran was also instrumental in developing um, uh, airplanes that were able to refuel uh, the bombers that would take off from the United States to bomb the different um, targets in the Soviet Union. Uh, and again, that came about because of the Basin study, because after the Basin study, all the planes that had been sighted in Europe were moved back to the United States, to the United States, and then they had to develop a way of be, being able to refuel these planes in midair, and thus they came up with the whole idea of refueling in midair with having another plane bringing in uh, the fuel and doing it like that. So that's the other thing that uh, that Rand was involved in. Uh, other people that came out of Rand also changed what had been, I don't know, uh, I mean really a, a lunatic way of looking at the world because basically they had the, the the United States government had a plan that said, you know, we have a problem with the Soviet Union because we don't have enough soldiers in, in, in Western Europe. We're just going to drop a bomb on them. And we're not just going to drop one bomb, mind you. We're going to blast them all out of existence. Uh, it was called the SIOP, uh, uh, the plan for basically blasting the Soviet Union to smithereens, not only the Soviet Union, but the entire uh, um, Eastern Europe uh, and, the entire, and the entire Warsaw Pact Alliance and China for good measure. So there was a scientist that came out of Rand. His name was Dan Ellsberg, Daniel Ellsberg, who later on became very famous because of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, and he was the one that was able to pressure Robert McNamara and the Kennedy administration into changing that operating plan and to make sure that if there was a problem in Western Europe that we wouldn't just be going around and actually trying to wipe out the Soviet Union. The problem was that, and there's so much to talk about, because after all, the Rand Corporation also had come up with these plans and these what-if scenarios um, that said basically, you know, we can survive a nuclear war. And that's what they did in the 1950s. And that's why they were so closely tied into the development of what President Eisenhower later called the military-industrial complex. Researchers in Iran really believed that as long as 10 million of us survived the nuclear war, that we had won. Even if 90 million of us died, it doesn't matter, because the other 10 million would be able to survive, would be able to come up and, you know, come out of their caves and the mine shafts and everywhere where they were being, <laughs> they were taking shelter and they would be able to recreate the world. Of course, President Eisenhower, when he was presented with these plans, said that's total nonsense. As he said, there wouldn't be enough shovels to be able to scrape away all the dead that we'd have all over the country. But these people who were allied with the Rand Corporation and with industrialists who actually stood to make a lot of money out of developing these new weapons of destruction kept pressuring President Eisenhower into increasing the Pentagon budget. But Eisenhower cut it back. So instead, what they did is that they went around and they picked someone who they knew would be much more malleable and who, in fact, would increase the Pentagon budget by a dozenfold. And his name was John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who was, in a way, a creature of the military-industrial complex. One of the reasons why Kennedy came 
into the White House is that he was going around saying, well, we have a missile gap. The Soviet Union has so many more missiles than we do. Well, it was nonsense. None of that existed, actually. The missile gap was in our favor, which is something that Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara had to admit within the first few months after he took office, which is, you know, what we thought was there was not there. And how did that information come about? It came out of scientists at RAND, who, whether deliberately or not, fed that information to the Kennedy camp. So Kennedy would be able to go around and say, the Russians are going to beat us. The Russians are going to have our lunch. The Russians are going to destroy us. There's a missile gap, and they're going to wipe us out, which, is course, which of course, was not the case. So it's, it's, it's a long and complicated relationship between the RAND Corporation and the military industrial complex. RAND researchers, to this day, look down on the CIA. They think they're amateurs. They think they're fumblers. They think they don't know what they're doing. They think that just by going around and playing that spy versus spy that, you know, they'll be able to get control of the world. These guys know better. But you have in the RAND Corporation is the cult of reason. The belief that reason can solve all problems. That there is nothing that reason cannot mend or cure or improve. I don't think that's the case, and I think most of you probably don't think that either. But that's what they believed. So therefore, they think that the CIA is a whole bunch of fumblers, of people who are amateurs who don't know what they're doing. So from the beginning, it's true that they cooperated with the CIA, uh, and they did research that later on was utilized by the CIA. Uh, a very famous example of that was the Viet Cong uh, study that was done in the 1960s, a uh, Viet Cong morale study that was commissioned by President Johnson and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara as to what motivated the Viet Cong, which is the forces of national liberation in South Vietnam. Uh, you know, they, they gave this report to the federal government to McNamara and to Johnson. And they said, these guys are not motivated by reason. These guys are there because they're patriots, because they want to have a better country, because they really believe that they're being taken advantage of by the colonial powers, and they see the United States as a colonial power, and they're willing to die for their cause. Nobody listened to that. Uh, they, uh, Rand was also involved in a number of studies uh, in counterinsurgency as well. Uh, matter of fact, they probably uh, hosted the first conference on counterinsurgency back in the 1950s. And they were even advocating military coups in third world countries, thinking that, again, if you have a small group of military who have been trained, hopefully in the United States, if not there, then in Europe, but people who believe in reason, again, who believe in technological advancement, who believe that people can be improved and that things can be ameliorated by the use of reason and by the use of you know, American resources, that it was better to have the military go in and stage coups and therefore lift all these countries out of the quagmire of poverty and ignorance that they found themselves in. And they hosted a number of conferences like that, in a way almost instigating these military to stage coups, which by the way happened later, happened in Peru, happened in Chile, happened in Brazil. Obviously, they were not directly involved. They weren't there distributing the weapons to all these people, but they were certainly the intellectual parents of what happened. I do believe that the national security apparatus that was established after the Second World War serves as an excuse to extend the power of the federal government. Now, you have to realize, though, when you look at it from a historical point of view, that there's always been two countervailing tendencies within the United States, right from the time of the Founding Fathers, in that you had Hamilton and Jefferson on the other side, with, uh, you know, Jefferson advocating uh, federalism, with uh, the power, power being uh, given to local communities, uh, to uh, gentlemen farmers, uh, to decentralize authority, and Hamilton, on the other hand, advocating a strong central government, very much on the European model, um, and uh, with Washington, most of the time, falling into Hamilton's camp. 
So you have this constant back and forth, back and forth between the Federalists and uh, the, lack of a better word, the Centralists, you know. Um, and uh, it went back and forth up until the Second World War when, because of the menace uh, that was, that was um, the Axis powers and the, second, and the way in which we defeated them uh, by expanding the power of the federal government, and later on, because of the menace posed as well by the Soviet Union, or at least the perceived threat of the Soviet Union, uh, also expanded the power of the federal government. And in a way, as many others have said, uh, it just became an excuse, an excuse to expand further and further the influence of the federal government in everyday affairs. And that's a fact. There's, there's no denying that. Rand was not directly involved in the setting up of the United Nations. However, there were people who were involved in the setting up of the United Nations who then went to work at Rand. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about Rand is not necessarily what Rand does as an institution, but what the people who work within Rand do and their influence within Rand and, and later on in the world at large. Uh, I mean, I guess the most recent example of that would be Donald Rumsfeld, who, you know, was. Um, chairman of the board of RAN uh, before he became Secretary of Defense under uh, President George Bush. Uh, as regards the UN, you have to realize that a lot of the people that founded RAN were actively advocating a one world government and they did believe that the United Nations served as sort of like a template for that. But actually they thought that there should be another organization that would actually supersede the United Nations, uh, an organization that would be directly controlled by the United States and that would serve as a world government. And that's why some of the leaders, the early leaders of Iran, such as John Williams, advocated preemptive nuclear strikes on the Soviet Union to make sure that the United States would be the only country in the world that had the supreme power, which is to say nuclear weapons, to be able to impose its will on the rest of the world. False flag attacks, obviously, are when one country comes up with a pretext for attacking another country. In the United States, the most famous example of that is the Gulf of Tonkin and the tall Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, when President Johnson knew or suspected or should have known that the information that he was receiving about an attack by the North Vietnamese was totally false. But yet he used that to be able to go to Congress and then to approve a resolution authorizing the deployment of American troops in Southeast Asia. There's also the Northwoods uh, report or incident, uh, in, which is uh, a proposal of, by the Pentagon to, again, use false flags uh, to provoke the United States into invading Cuba in 1962. Of course, that came out, that was proposed before um, uh, the uh, missile crisis of October 1962, so that actually never uh, took place. However, uh, you know, I have seen documents in which that was one of the things that were proposed by uh, RAND planners uh, as among a slew of possibilities to be considered if and when it was necessary uh, by the United States. I've also seen the documents as well from the Pentagon as well, from the chiefs of staff who were pressing President Kennedy to go ahead with the Northwood plan and, you know, go ahead and just uh, find a pretext to go in and, and invade Cuba. So those are things that have always been taken into consideration. You have to realize that what the RAND Corporation does is to come up with a whole slew of what-if scenarios. What would we do under this? What would we do under that? If this happens, what do we do then? If that happens, what do we do in that case? And they never stop to think, is that the right thing to do? There's a total immorality in the plans of an organization like the RAND Corporation. A total immorality in their planning, in their thinking, because they're just there to propose alternatives. They're not there to tell the powers that be, this is right or this is wrong. Their excuse is that they're just not responsible for whatever actions these people actually will take according to the plans that they propose. Of course, they know, they should know, that when you're framing the argument, when you're saying these are the different things that you can do, that therefore you're giving carte blanche to any one of those things to happen, even though some of those may be ethically repugnant to most people on this earth.
such as, for instance, a false flag attacking another country under pretext because saying that, that, that country attacked.